I sing without instrumental music. I sing in the form of the chapel, i.e., I sing a cappella. So when I think about our Sunday morning, which will happen in just a, about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, what will we do when it comes to our worship time? And this is where I need you to, to engage with me. If you're here last year, you know this because this is going to be some things we talked about. What does our worship look like? What will it be included? Any thoughts? Prayers, Prayers absolutely. What else? Communion. I'm sorry? Communion. Communion. As a matter of fact, I, I, I saw a gym and the Delta were working on it, getting that set up and ready to go. Prayers, communion, what else? I'm sorry? Songs, absolutely. We're going to sing. Casey's prepared for that. We've got the prayers. What else? And the communion and the songs. Opening God's word. Opening God's word, and that's where that's where your preacher comes in. And whether it's in, in preaching or whether he's uh, uh, teaching a class, he's opening and he's speaking God's word. Lord's supper, praying, speaking, singing. What else? Is there anything else? Giving. Giving. That's another one of the elements of our worship. We, we can see all those, and quite honestly, we know why we do it, but do we know how to tell people why we do it? When, when someone comes in, in, into your circle of influence, and you're talking about church, and I hope that you do, I hope there's something you don't shy away from. For whatever reason, it seems like we shy away from religious, religion and politics, because those are polarizing. You're either over here or you're over here, and I don't want to polarize. Brothers and sisters, we don't have an option when it comes to, to the church. Politics, yes. But it's almost like we're more eager to talk politics than our church sometimes. But we should not be ashamed to own my Lord nor to defend his cause. So when I think about all these elements, the Lord's Supper and praying and singing and, and, and preaching and giving, we can literally, and you know this, we can go right here to God's Word and we can find book, chapter, and verse to help explain why we do what we do. And, and, and you know that, you see that, but I think my question to you would be, still, why do I do it? Why don't I use a piano? Why don't we have, why don't we have a band? What does God tell us music-wise when it comes to worship? I can read about praying, pray without ceasing. I can read about uh, uh, preaching the word. I can read about laying back in store. I can read about uh, uh, about um, uh, remember the, the, uh, the Lord's sacrifice the first day of the week. But what direction does God give us music-wise? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. There's actually a, a, a sister uh, passage that goes with this, and we could look at that one as well, but you're going to see you're going to see this. I'm going to give you both of these. Again, like I said on Friday, if you're a note taker, you may want to write these down. Ephesians chapter 5 uh, is, is the letter that Paul was writing to the church in Ephesus. The sister passage for this is Colossians chapter 3. So if you want to write those two down and kind of read those in your in your study, I'd encourage you to do that. But when you look at Ephesians 5, Paul is telling the church to imitate God. Look, be like God. Do the things that God would want you to do. Walk in love. Uh, don't partake in the, the deeds of darkness. Walk as children of light. He says that in verse 8. Do not participate in the fruitful deeds of darkness. That's verse 11. And then he says this in verse, in verse uh, uh, 13. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. We are to shine the light. For everything that becomes visible in, is light. For this reason, he, it says, and then he quotes. He's actually reaching back to the uh, book of Isaiah, and he says, Wake up, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Did you know that's actually a song in here? Did you know that you've got that in the song right here? Oh, take your song. Let's hold on to Ephesians. Don't lose that. But I, wanted, I think it's in here. I, I, may, I may be lying to you. I don't think so, though. Oh, I just made a liar on myself. Uh, there is a song that says, what is that? 931, is that it? Excellent, you did it. My God has said his light will shine, his light will shine in the hearts of men. 931 in, in here. Thank you so much. The fruitless deeds of darkness past, revealed by God, by, by Christ with glorious hand. Look at the refrain. 
Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And we read, wake up, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We can sing that passage, isn't that great? But we just have to get to know our second favorite book. But right here he's saying, shine your light, wake up. Don't, don't, don't participate in the fruits of the deeds of darkness. And then listen to what he says in verse 15. Therefore, since we need to wake up and we need to shine, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. He's not talking about our gait. He's not talking about if we walk with a, sw a swagger or if we walk with a march. He's talking about how you live. Watch how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise men. How does an unwise man walk or live? Stumbles he stumbles along. He's careless. He's not paying attention. You, you think about uh, you think <laughs> you think about what happens to you if the house is dark and it's the middle of the night, and you're going from uh, from the bed to the bathroom, and, and, and there's, a, there's a, a, a bench there, and you stub your toe on it because you don't see it. And part of it, you're half asleep, but part of it, you're not, you're not paying attention to what your environment is. We even do that when we're awake, or at least I do. So I've got to be, be thinking about here, when I'm walking, not physically walking, but when I'm living, I've got to be smart about what I'm doing. That means don't make stupid mistakes. I'm sorry I said that. for a pleasure to say that. There are young people listening. Don't make careless, foolish mistakes. And some of those would be the things that I, the people I hang around with, some of the places that I go. Those would be walking unwise. But walk as wise, making the most of your time, this is verse 16, because the days are evil. Can I get an amen out of that one? Folks, that was 2,000 years ago. The days are still evil. We've got to be smart in the way that we live our life. Look at verse 17. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then Paul wrote something that I did not understand. He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Or your translation might say debauchery. It's, it's carelessness. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. That's exactly what Scott said a moment ago. Always giving thanks in all things for the, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. We said to one another. We have to understand as we read this, don't get drunk with wine. What's the context? What is Paul trying to say? This is the scripture we use for singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You'll see that same wording in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Why does God inspire Paul to write verse 18? Don't get drunk with wine. Why would he throw that in? So make a point? What's the point? Well, that's the verse that says that be filled with the Spirit. It's talking about the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of drink. That's right. Don't be filled with the spirits. Be filled with the Spirit. Well, what happens when I'm filled with the spirits, you walk, stupid. you walk stupidly. That's it. You should have said that effort. You're not in the light. <laughs> you're not in the light. You're not thinking right. There is a. I've never drank. Okay, I want to make this disclaimer. I, I've never drank before in my life. There was a T-shirt I had whenever I was a little kid that said, "Lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine." That, that was just what we. Used. It was kind of a funny thing. I can see where. Anyway, what he, uh, what we understand from alcohol when we drink, it doesn't just make us a bumbling fool. It doesn't just put us into a coma state. The first stage of drunkenness is what they call euphoria. And if you're wondering what that looks like, think of the Andy Griffith show and Otis Campbell. You remember Otis? Oh, he was funny. He was so funny, almost cute. He was just kind of bumbling along and, and, and didn't have a care in the world. But you know what he was doing when he was in that drunken state of euphoria? And you know this because you've seen it. He had decreased anxiety. He wasn't nervous about things. He could just go and do things. He had an increased self-confidence. He, he was doing really good. And he was sociable. People liked him. Even though he was a town drunk, they liked that uh, that carefree attitude, that euphoria that he brought. 
there was an overwhelming sense of contentment. He seemed like everything was going really fine. That is a level of drunkenness. It's the first level of drunkenness, euphoria. But you know it doesn't stop there. What's the next stage of drunkenness? The next stage is lethargy and, and, and confusion. And, and, and this is where the stumbling starts to become even more intensified. Maybe even the falling down. But folks, that's not the end of drunkenness. That's not where drunkenness ends. It leads to, and it will continue on into a stupor, into a coma state, almost even to death. Paul said, don't get drunk with wine. Because even though you might find euphoria there, that's not where it ends. Don't get your euphoria from the spirits. Get your euphoria from the spirit. Well, how can I how can I get increased a decreased anxiety and increased self confidence in, in, in the spirit? Thank you, Paul, for writing verse 18. I'm sorry, verse 19. But be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When I sing with you, it's not a solo act. It's you and I blending our voices together. Whether we're on key or not, when we're singing together, we can reach and find that euphoria. We can find that increased confidence. We, we can be able to sing with a little bit more uh, energy and excitement. I can find that decreased anxiety when I'm singing. Unfortunately, what the devil does, because remember, he finds all this, is the devil makes it where we become self-conscious. I don't sing very good. And just the opposite of what God intended with our singing, it becomes more of a criticism of ourselves or of others. But that's not the way God intended. If we don't understand that the reason that God said, don't get drunk with wine, don't reach your euphoria with the spirits, but do it with the spirit, that helps us to understand singing. Now, if you're still wondering what, what exactly am I I don't think I, I follow with you. Maybe you're, maybe you're like me and you've never, you've never had a drink of wine. You've never had a drink of alcohol. You don't understand that, but you've never experienced it. Let me give you this. There were some folks I knew, this was several years ago, and uh, they were not members of the church. Uh, they, were, they were friends uh, from within school. I don't remember if school or where it was exactly. But they told Vicki and I, that sometimes they're raising kids and young children, they really kept them frazzled. And sometimes they needed a glass of wine to take the edge off. Do you know what they were doing? They were reaching euphoria with the spirits. They were getting drunk with wine. They weren't bumbling around, but they were taking the edge off and they were reaching that self-confidence with the alcohol. God said, don't do that. You, you need to take the edge off, do it with a song. And not just a secular song, but a song like, I need thee every hour, or, O oh, wonderful Savior, is Jesus my Lord, or take time to be holy. Maybe you need to speak to yourself in those, in those instances. We can take the edge off with the Holy Spirit without having to reach into the world. I think there are benefits to our singing. And you know this too, because Scott, you did it for us last night. We had our airy white singing, and about about ninety minutes we were singing. But while we were singing, we were encouraging each other, we were admonishing one another. And then Scott took us with the kids and, and sang this little light of mine and rolled the gospel chariot. And I was surprised you didn't do the wrapped up tie of pain. Have you ever done that one? I can't do that. You'll, you'll pull a muscle <laughs> on it. <laughs> you rolled the gospel chariot though. That was good. But we sing those songs to instruct our kids. We teach them to shine your light and make sure people know that you are, just as we've read here in, in Ephesians, that you are a child of God and you want to shine the light. And we, we sing to worship and to praise him. I want to take you to four passages. So if you've got your Bible, especially if you, if you will write these down, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 14, 15, James chapter 5, verse 13, Romans chapter 15 and 9, and Ephesians chapter 5, 19, which we've just been at. In all four of those passages, we're going to look at them in detail in just a moment. 
all four of those passages use the word sing with a very defined Greek word. The Greek word for sing is solo. And, and when you hear that word, and when you read that word in the Greek solo, it means to sing. So let's look at this real quick, and then we're going we're gonna to go through that. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, it's the basis of what uh, this seminar is all about. When Paul says, what is the outcome then? We're talking about the, the gifts and the, the, the abilities that, that God gives to, to his people at that point. I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit. I will solo with the spirit and I will solo with the mind also. Singing, that's actually verbalizing and vocalizing words and songs. In Romans chapter 15, Paul again is writing now to the church in Rome. And he says, Christ has become a servant to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. And I want to stop real quickly here. Christ has become a servant to the circumcision. I'm not going to get into the medical, but you know what a circumcision is. It's a cutting of the flesh. Think Acts chapter 2, when when, Paul, when Peter's preaching, and they were pierced to the heart, they were cut to the heart. You see, when people understand what Christ does for us, it pierces us, it, it circumcises us, it cuts us. He is a circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. And then Paul quotes the Psalms. And he says, for it is written, therefore I will give praise to you, this is to God, among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. When Paul translated that from, from the Hebrew, the Old Testament, he brought it in, he wrote it, and he used the word solo. He used the word, the Greek word solo. I will sing to your name. Not play an instrument, but to sing. James chapter 5, verse 13. James writes, this is the brother of Jesus. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he is to pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to solo praises, sing praises. The last one, and then uh, and we'll get into this word sing a little bit deeper. But be filled with the Spirit. We just read this. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Soloing in your heart and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Singing. Now, if you were to go back into the historical translation of that Greek word solo, there are some who said, well, actually solo means to pluck. To actually twang or to pluck. And they, and they actually wrote the definition down to be this. To pluck off, to pull, to cause to vibrate by touching, to twang, to strike or touch the core, to twang the strings of an instrument in its gentle vibrations, to play a string instrument such as the harp. That's what solo means. And then others came back and said, no, no, no. Let's go back to the original and understand this. What it means is to sing. It's the vocal cords. We're going to dig into this, but you need to understand the conflict that was taking place in Christendom. The idea that we could play or, or, or we should sing. Well, I want to ask you this. If it means to pluck, what is the instrument that we should be twanging or plucking? Or we have vocal cords, don't we? Have you ever heard this phrase? Man, that really pulled on my heartstrings. Ah, oh, it touched my heart. Twanging our heart. That's what, that's what Paul is saying here. He says, speaking and making melody with your heart. We sing with our voice. If you want to call it plucking, then quite honestly, the instrument that you pluck is your heart. But if someone says, well, well yeah, but, but a, a guitar can be plucked. It never says guitar. But if you want to get really expressive and say, well, I think I can play my guitar or the piano has, has chords, well, guess what, folks? Every one of us have to do it. It's not one person who does the plucking. It's not one person who does the soloing. It's all of us, which means all of us better get out a guitar. I can't do that. I can't do that. 
I can't play any instrument. And if that's the case, get rid of the drums. There's no trumpets because there are no strings. There's nothing to pluck on those instruments. But we have to go back to the text. And it says, singing and making melody with your heart. I want to look at the heart real quickly. Now, the heart can also mean the emotional seat. That, that's, where, that's where we live. But we think of the heart as our, the organ that keeps us alive. So I want to look at the heart for just a moment. I'm not a doctor, okay? So there's no medical background here except for what I've studied and people have shared with me. The heart's made up of the right and the left atrium, the right and le left and right aorta, the pulmonary aorta, the pulmonary vein, the, the tricuspid, the pulmonary valves, the, the ventricles, all of these are made up, make up the heart. But there's also something deep inside this muscle that we call the heart, which is called the Purkinje fibers. The Purkinje fibers have electrical impulses that cause the valves to open and, and close. That's what keeps our heart beating. My brother's a retired nurse. Uh, he uh, was in California for many years, and when things happened in 2020, it kind of pushed him out of, 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 edu out of nursing. But years ago, I asked him, because I, I was studying this way back then, I mean, back in the, in, the, in the 90s, and I said, what do you know about Purkinje fibers? And he told me just what I shared with you, that they're responsible for the electrical impulses that open and shut the valves. And I said, what happens if those, those uh, or what causes those electrical impulses to, to vibrate, to twang, to open? And he said, well, we, we really don't know. We just know if they stop, then you don't live. Have you ever seen or heard about people taking those and shocking somebody when, they, when they've had a heart attack? They're trying to get those Purkinje fibers vibrating again. They're trying to get the body moving again. And I think it's very interesting when you look at what the purpose is of those. I want you to read this. Purkinje fibers are an indispensable part of the function of the heart. And they're vital for our survival. Without the Purkinje fibers, we don't live. Their purpose is to relay electrical signals within the heart. But look at this. Purkinje fibers allow the heart's conduction system. Conduction system? That's interesting. Conducting? Conduction system to create synchronized contractions. Synchronized means we're working together. Of its ventricles and are therefore essential for maintaining a consistent heart rhythm. Do you hear the musical phrases that come from describing this, this, uh, this part of our heart? We do these same things. We try to sing with rhythm. That's what our songs are about. There's someone who conducts the, the song service, if you will. There, there's, a, uh, th there's the idea of harmonizing and, and being in harmony, and that's what the heart is. And what's so interesting about this is even back in the 1800s, Fanny J. Crosby knew this. Fanny J. Crosby wasn't a doctor. She was just a poet. But she wrote the song, do you remember it? Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Remember that one? Well, Casey, we always seem to skip verse 3 sometimes, don't we? Look at verse 3. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Okay, think about that for real quickly. How many times do you feel like we're, we're, we're crushed? Our spirit has been crushed. Our heart's been crushed. Touched by a loving hand, our heart, wakened by kindness, a, a kind word, chords that were broken will vibrate once more. There's, there's, the, there's the vibration of the heart. Just in this simple song that was written in the 1800s, and, and she's not the only one. Early 1900s, there's within my heart a melody. Just think of that title in of itself. Look at verse 2. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord, a lack of harmony, filled my heart with pain. When we don't get along together, it hurts. But Jesus swept across those broken strings, the broken strings of my heart, and he stirred those slumbering chords. The heart's asleep. He stirred those slumbering chords again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. 
fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. 1869, Ben J. Crosby is writing about the human heart and how the chords of the heart, even though sometimes they can feel broken because of things that hurt us, they can vibrate again because of songs. Or discord, broken strings, uh, we see that in that, in that song, There's a Heart Melody. That idea of a lack of agreement, tension and confusion, harsh sounds, that's what discord is. And yet when we come to sing, we can understand the value that God gives us through our songs. It's important for us to understand again how singing a cappella without instruments is seen in scripture. I'll take you to Acts chapter 16. You may remember this as through your study. Paul and Silas have been thrown in prison. If you want to read this and see this, I encourage you to do this. The question might be is, well, what'd they do? How come they're in prison? Did they, they steal? Did they kill somebody? Uh, were they fighting? What happened to put them in prison? Do you remember what happened? There was a woman who was demon possessed. She had the ability to, to, uh, uh, to see in the future. And she was following Paul and Silas, and she was saying these egregious words. These men are from God, the Most High, bringing to you salvation. That's what she was saying. And the scripture says she got, Paul got annoyed. <laughs> That's the way he, he, he reads it. Most likely because she was saying it over and over and over again, and her reputation was not very good. If someone comes and says, um, <clears throat> man, I really think you need to uh, uh, you need to go and, and get your lumber out at the Bethel because they really know how to do it and these are people that are really not reputable people but yet they're they're speaking up for you and they kept saying over and over you need to go out there and you need to go over there and you go yeah but I know your reputation why would I trust you to go out there do you see what I'm saying and that's what this woman was doing and Paul was getting annoyed with it and so he beat her up you know that's not the case he cast the demon out of her he healed her. And the reason they were thrown in jail is because her handlers, the people who were pimping her out, the people who were making money off of her demonic abilities, they lost their money. They lost their resources. Have you heard this phrase? Follow the money? If you ever want to know what motivates people, follow the money. And their money was just taken away. So what are they going to do? We're going to take Paul and Silas and throw them in prison. And so Paul and Silas were beat, not with whips, but with rods. They've been beat with rods and they've been put in their feet in shacks and shackles. And they're sitting there and the scripture says, Acts chapter 16, verse 25, that about midnight they were singing. They were singing praises to God. But I think what makes this so interesting to me is the scripture, con the, the statement continues, the verse continues, and the prisoners were listening. Paul and Silas were worshiping God. But they were impacting other people because it was vocal. People could hear them. Our singing must be vocal. It can't just be something I'm thinking about. But also, our singing, when you think about the, the fact that what we do, it's not just here, it's also in our mind. And we looked at that already in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind or the understanding. Do we think this through or do we just go through the motions? And then finally, I know our clock is running low on us. Singing is emotional. And I would take you back over uh, to Colossians 3, that, that sister one. Go ahead and turn there if you want to real quick. Colossians 3, 16. Paul is writing again to the church in, in Colossae. Just as he mirrored over there with, uh, <coughs> with Ephesus, he's talking about how we need to put on the new self. We need to be different. And he says in verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. In other words, this is something that's internal. This is something that I feel. And you know where that's at because you've been there before when you stood by the graveside and you sung a song putting your parents to rest and your grandparents to rest. And then you come back in to the church a couple of months later or maybe even a year later and that song is sung, and what happens? Yeah, the tears start to flow. Because it's mental, is taking you back. It, 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 or maybe it's the goosebumps that rise up on your arms. Our singing must be emotional. It must be something that we feel. 
Folks, we'll never feel our singing if we just go through the routine. But we have to think about it, and we also have to verbalize it. I'm going to end with this passage, Leviticus chapter 10. I shared this with you last year, so this may be a recap for you. It's, uh, it's the beginning of the, the old um, the setup of worship in the tabernacle. And Aaron is the high priest, and Aaron's got four sons. Two of them are Nadab and Abihu. They are the, if you will, preachers. And the whole assembly, the whole congregation is assembled. And Nadab and Abihu, in verse 1, says, The sons of Aaron took their respective fire pans, and after putting fire in them, they placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded. I don't know what that looked like. I really don't. I don't know if there was a, a specific uh, um, source of coal that they needed to use for that fire. I don't know if there was something that God said, I want it to be done in this direction. Some will even say that they were drunk when they did that. And you can see that as you read further in Leviticus chapter 10. I don't know exactly what it is, but I do know this. It was foreign, or it was, in some translations say strange. It was not what God had asked of them. Well, the question has to be is, what happened to Nadab and Bidu? Did God say, boys, I wish I'd have done that. You know better. Well, you better not, you better not do that again next time. What did God do when they disobeyed him? The scripture continues, and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and burnt the boys, the preachers, to death. Now that, to you and I, might seem a little heavy-handed. Ooh, why would God do that? I think it was very clear. God was setting a standard. He was setting expectation. This is what I want you to do. I want you to do this. And you didn't do it. It's not what I commanded and I'm going to take your life. Why do you think? Because they were starting something new. This is the very beginning of the tabernacle worship. And God's thought process, in my opinion, was if you keep going down this road, what's next? I oh, would want to do it this way. Well, I wish you wouldn't. I gave you that direction. But this is what we understand. Aaron's boys are dead. Half of his sons are gone. And they were preachers. And Aaron, you would think, would be ready to rip his clothes because uh, that was the standard if, you, if something, you're mourning. Or he would weave or wail, well, what's happening? But before that takes place, Moses, which is the boy's uncle, Aaron's brother, he comes to Aaron and he says, it's what the Lord spoke. You know what God said. Aaron, you know what God told us. By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. If you come to me, Treat me, God said, as holy. And by all the people, before all the people, I will be honored. Brothers and sisters, our God still must be treated as holy. Our God still must be honored. Are we doing that today? Now, he's not striking us dead. If that was the case, there would be a lot of people who are doing a lot of egregious things in his name who would be burned to a crisp. But I believe that uh, he is slow in his judgment. I just need to know that I, what I am doing when it comes to my sacrifice is pleasing God. And this is where I want to leave you with this last thought. In just a moment, we're going to sing uh, in our worship time. We're going to open the song book. Casey's going to lead us in some songs. That is going to be your opportunity to sacrifice. Did you realize that? Hebrews chapter 13. The Hebrew writer wrote this. Through him, that would be through Jesus Christ, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. Let us, through Christ, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And how am I going to do that? What does that look like? The Hebrew writer tells us that is the fruit of lips. That's what we do with our mouths. That's our sacrifice of praise, and that's what gives thanks to Him. So, I want to ask you this as we wrap up this morning. When it comes to worship, which we will do in just a few moments, when we worship, when you worship, because our worship is individualized, what kind of sacrifice are you going to give to God? 
Will it be one that's acceptable to him? Or will it be what you want to give? We talked about that last, yesterday, I think it was, or maybe Friday, about our, our sacrifice. Do we just pull up any old lamb? It's got a bum leg? No, we're going to do our very best. Will we do our very best this morning? Or will we just kind of go through the motions? Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to go through the motions. Why do I choose a cappella? Why do I love a cappella from a biblical standpoint? It's because I love my Lord and I love my God. And I want to honor Him. And that's why I choose to do what I do. Now some people will say, well, I think that I can do other things. Biblically, the word solo means to sing. And if you do want to call it a pluck, then you better pluck your heart. Because there is no instrument to be plucked. Let's go ahead and go to our Father in prayer and then we'll, we'll wrap up with, uh, and take a couple of minutes before we get started on our sheet. Father, thank you so much for this morning. I pray that, uh, that we will, Father, always want to honor you and treat you as holy. Forgive us, Father, when we get wrapped up in this world because it's so easy. The devil's really good at deceiving us and, and causing us to lose our focus. But I pray you'll help us to stand strong in your word, in your ways, and honor you and give you the glory. It's my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.